Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to yet another installment in the Officio Assassinora mini-series, where today we're going to have a look at the Calexus Temple. And this is a different beast entirely than Eversor, Varnus, or Vindicar. For what makes the Calexus so lethal is not a high-powered sniper rifle, a specialized piece of equipment, or a cocktail of drugs vicious enough to kill the user without countermeasures, nor is it a specialized strategy or doctrine like the Calidus Assassin's exceptional talents at infiltration. Instead, the Calexus is born with their preferred weapon of assassination, namely the fact that they belong to one of, if not the most rare strain of mutation in the entire galaxy. They possess the Pariah Gene. I have already done a more in-depth video talking about the Pariah Gene and blanks in general, this being a specialized mutation that results in what is colloquially referred to as soulless individuals. Humans that have no spark, no light in the warp, and therefore as far as demonic creatures are concerned, do not exist. They are invisible and for everyone else, they come across as extremely disconcerting, as uncomfortable to be around at very best, and horrific at worst. Indeed, the aura of discomfort that radiates out from even a low-level blank individual usually means that they will be straight up murdered in their infancy frequently by their very own parents. And for psychers, those with an exceptionally strong connection to the warp, a blank, a pariah, is a living nightmare made manifest, whereas the presence of a pariah is considered extremely disturbing to a normal human, for a psyker, the presence of a pariah will almost certainly result in them being driven into suicidal madness. And that is merely the effect of the pariah gene in its basic, unmodified state, before the Calexus Temple gets done with weaponizing it. It is uh, frankly difficult to overstate just how horrifying a Calexus assassin uh, would be to a psyker. And so we're not going to be delving too much into the pariah genes and blanks in this video since, well, as mentioned, I have already done a full video on that. Instead, we will be focusing on the recruiting, training, operation, and of course targets of the Calexus assassin because they are not used purely against psychers. They certainly favor targets of a psychic nature, but the Calexus Temple is flexible enough, and the Pariah Gene also, as mentioned, does not only affect psychers. So, let us begin then with the recruiting process, because this is where it already starts getting really, really complicated for the Calexus Temple. Now, whilst good aspirants for the Vindicard or the Calidus or the Eversword are not exactly a dime a dozen either for the Calexus, who require all of their operatives to be psychic blanks, a mutation that happens perhaps once in a trillion individuals, yeah, it gets quite difficult to find suitable recruits. Especially as blanks are quite popular. The God Emperor's most holy inquisition, for example, scour the galaxy for signs of blanks, because they come in very handy indeed when you're hunting down rogue psychers and demonic manifestations. And then of course there's the Sisters of Silence, who further cut down upon the available numbers of blank by discarding fully half of them, only picking up the female half. <laughs> I guess sexism really doesn't pay. <laughs> 
And, of course, there's also the Navi Snobilite. Now, they don't want blanks, they want the exact opposite. They would like to see all blanks wiped out from the galaxy because, well, they're all psychers. And as we've already mentioned, uh, they're not particularly fond of blanks. And they may pay a great deal of money to see the occasional blank uh, disappeared. In fact, they were the ones who put a stop to the Colexus Temple's primary way of creating new blanks back in the good old days. Now, the temple needs to scour the galaxy for the handful of worthy initiates it can find, and then train them very, very carefully so as to not break them. But back in the good old days, the Colexus Temple, when it was still located on Terra, had a close cooperation with the Adeptus Mechanicus, where the two work together to clone Kalexa's operatives. This was of course hugely beneficial to the temple, because it didn't have to scour the entire goddamn galaxy for the one in a trillion blank. And then the one in a million blanks that can actually survive Kalexa's training on top of that. They could simply mass produce them in the comforts of their own basements. And for the Adeptus Mechanicus, it was a most fascinating area of study. The blank is an abnormality, a monstrosity, a nearly impossible mutation, since they seem to go against one of the fundamental laws of the 41st millennium, namely that every creature has a soul, a flame in the warp. Even the Tau have this flame, it is just much, much, much smaller than most living creatures. Whereas with the Kalexus, it isn't that they have a very small warp signature, it is that they just flat out don't have one. And the Mechanicus, Magos Biologist Departments in particular, are of course deeply, obsessively, perversely delighted and enamoured with such clear and blatant freaks of nature. Alas, the Navis nobility cruelly and unscientifically demanded that the poor and innocent inquisitive Mechanicus be barred from conducting any further thrilling human experiments on the Navigator House's doorsteps. Ah, truly, the pioneering spirit of progressive science suffers ever so heavily beneath the cold, oppressive hand of bigoted ignoramuses. I mean, yes, granted, from the point of view of the Navigators, what the Mechanicus was doing was hardly much short of crossbreeding satanic rape ovens with velociraptors, but hey, details. I mean, <laughs> it's not like Mechanicus experiments have a habit of going horribly, dreadfully wrong or anything. And I am, of course, absolutely certain that conducting these ghastly anti psycho experiments on inherently unstable clones of psychopathic mass murderers right next door to the largest gathering of psychers in the Imperium couldn't possibly go wrong in any way, shape or form. In exactly the same way that I see nothing potentially going amiss with placing a facility that tests the effect of methamphetamine on rabbits next to the world's largest carrot museum. But sadly, such reasonable objections fell upon deaf ears, and the higher lords of terror were convinced that the Mechanicus should be ordered to discontinue their experiments. The Mechanicus vowed that they would, and that they had, that they had made sure to execute all of the current test subjects, disassemble all of the machinery, and never resume the program. The fact that the number of executions did not match up with the numbers of test subjects, and the fact that a lot of the machinery was apparently moved off-world before being <coughs> destroyed, well... <laughs> Let's not pay too much attention to these uh, inconsistencies, shall we? 
Oh, and, uh, I'm of course not saying anything here, but it sure is fortunate, isn't it, that the Calexus Temple manages to get a hold of just enough new aspirants. Despite the fact that blanks are so unfathomably rare, it's uh, also quite interesting how the Adeptus Mechanicus at one point tried to reclaim control over the so-called Fortress of the Solus, the original Calexus Temple on Terra, and, well, that, that dispute ended with the um, Adept in charge being shot at a suspiciously long range. Hmm... <laughs> It's almost enough to get the nogging jogging, is it not? And at the end of the day, regardless of where the eggs may be coming from, the Calexus Assassin still has a great deal of work in making it into a nice, tasty, murderous omelette. Even more work, in fact, than pretty much any of the other temples. For whilst finding suitable recruits for the Eversword or the Vindicar Temple and so on is hardly easy, they do usually have at least a little bit in the way of the luxury of choice, since they can recruit both independently and from the absolutely gargantuan organization that is the Scholar Progenium. And whilst theoretically the Collectors could of course recruit from the Scholar as well, Again, we return to the unfortunate truth that is the statistical improbability of a blank's existence in the first place, and the even smaller chance of said blank being related to some imperial family of distinguished merit that died in the service of the god emperor, therefore affording their children access to the scholar progenium. And by extension, therefore, the Calexus Temple is almost entirely reliant upon their own recruitment process, and the generosity, I guess you could call it, of other Imperial organizations. The Black Ships, for example, may on occasion pick up a blank, or perhaps the Inquisition may offer up one or two for the Calexus Temple in return for a favor here or there. But once again, I remind you of just how valuable the Inquisition believe a blank to be. They uh, aren't going to be handing one over easily, so such trades are quite rare. Wrangling one from the black ships may be easier, but, well, the black ships very rarely pick up blanks. Technically speaking, they are a psychic mutation and so fall within the purview of the black ships, but very few planets will know that a blank is even, well, technically speaking, a psyker. Hell, most planets and official Imperial organizations don't even know that blanks exist, much less how to correctly identify and catalog them. And of course, the black ships themselves also require a constant stream of new blanks, since they use them to subdue the psychic prisoners they pick up from the various planets, seeing as the black ships themselves are designed to go out into the galaxy, gather up psychers, and then bring them back to Terra. And these psychers can vary wildly in power from the essentially harmless to the cataclysmically dangerous that could potentially pose a threat to entire solar systems. So yeah, you don't want to be skimping on the blanks there either. Not to put too fine of a point on it, but in all due likelihood the Calexus Temple will have to fend for itself when it comes to finding new recruits, as they will not be able to rely over much upon the charity of other Imperial organizations. So how does one go about finding a blank? Spoiler alert, it is not easy, not in the slightest. Whereas with psychers, well, that's already a little bit of a challenge, but at least there you have some clues to work with. Psychic powers are, well, depending upon their nature, not necessarily stealthy, though 
They can also technically be very stealthy, as psychic powers do not follow any kind of prescribed pattern. It could be quite literally anything. But pretty much every single person within the Imperium knows at least to some degree what a Psyker is, and most, at least organized and civilized worlds within the Imperium, have organizations dedicated to locating and incarcerating Psykers, making them ready for a pickup by the Black Ships, as they go through their endless patrol pattern through the Imperium. Additionally, psychers can locate other psychers. They can see their flame in the warp, so to say, meaning that depending upon the power of the psyker doing the searching and the psyker being searched for, it could theoretically be possible to spot a psyker from orbit. A blank, however, well, obviously that trick isn't going to work. And to make things worse, not a whole lot of people within the Imperium know what a blank is, and even if they did have some kind of vague idea of what a blank was, well, think about it, how do you identify a blank? He makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> well, there's plenty of people who make me feel uncomfortable without being psychic blanks, if you catch my drift. It isn't exactly much of a giveaway, now is it? And even if you knew specifically what you were looking for in that sense of unease, a normal human being still could not really determine if it is a blank or not. Because, well, sometimes you run into people that you just naturally dislike. And if you are specifically looking for people that make you feel uncomfortable, or that you have a feeling of dislike or disdain towards, well, I imagine the confirmational bias there is going to be um, quite high, especially considering the potential rewards for finding a psychic blank. And so the only real way to test would be to get a psyker and place him next to the suspected blank. If the Psyker appears unfazed, then uh, not a blank. If the Psyker starts gouging his own eyes out with his fingernails, then you're probably onto something. But unfortunately, that is not a very practical solution. You can't just put a collar on a Psyker and drag him around the galaxy, rubbing him up against random strangers. Well, I mean, you could, but it probably wouldn't be an overly effective way of locating blanks. And the hard truth is that there isn't an overly effective way of locating blanks. Most of them are discovered by sheer coincidence. Gregor Eisenhorn, for example, discovered his Elizabeth Beckwin working as a pleasure girl. Through no design or planning, he simply came across her in the course of his investigation. Another famous example would be the hero Commissar Cyphus Kane, and his ubiquitous sidekick, Jürgen. Kane had no idea that Jürgen was a psychic blank. He spent years together with Jürgen as his closest aide and confidant, and perhaps even friend, none the wiser. Everyone, including the Commissar, simply assumed that Jürgen's unsociable nature had more to do with his somewhat earthy aroma rather than any psychic gift or curse. It was only through his on-and-off acquaintance with his fuck-buddy Amberly Vale that he eventually realised that Jürgen was not just antisocial, because Amberly Vale also happened to be an Inquisitor. <laughs> Talk about sticking your dick in a bear trap. Now, I must say, there are certain kinds of trouble that are simply not worth it, no matter how bouncy the booty. But the Inquisitor and the Commissar met one another whilst investigating a gene stealer cult, or, well, she was investigating a gene stealer cult. Commissar Cyphus Kane was, I believe, running away from something. 
at the rough time when they ran into one another. And at the time, the Inquisitor was accompanied by a Psyker as a part of her retinue. A Psyker that reacted quite extremely to the presence of Jürgen. And being a full-fledged Inquisitor, Amberly knew what a psychic blank was, and after the immediate catastrophe was dealt with, she had it confirmed that Jürgen was indeed a psychic blank. But she decided to let Jürgen stay with Commissar Kane, in no small part due to the fact that Jürgen, although a relatively low-level blank, would still be considered extremely valuable if the fact that he was a blank ever became public knowledge. And so she decided to keep him her little secret, so that she might call upon Jürgen's and Kane's services if ever she needed them. An arrangement that the Commissar, although not being overly happy with it, was powerless to resist. So if even in these cases the blanks were discovered essentially by accident, how do the Kalexas do it? Well, there actually isn't a whole lot of information describing how they do it. But if I were to be asked to speculate, which seems reasonable considering this is kind of a question we need to answer, <laughs> you know? Where do the Kalexas assassins come from? Eh? <laughs> it's not really a satisfactory answer now, is it? So, the most obvious answer, of course, would be that the Adeptus Mechanicus, despite promising ever so honestly, of course, to cease and desist any further cloning experiments, may not have been entirely honest in their promises. It would hardly be the first time the Mechanicus lied to the Imperium, and certainly not the last either. And it may not be the Mechanicus at large, it could have been a splinter organization, a group of radical Majos biologists for example, or hell, even a group of adepts who decided that their loyalties lay more with the Officio than it did with the Mechanicus possibly encouraged by uh, a pistol to their spine, who knows? But cloning seems to be the most likely and reasonable explanation. It would also present at least one facet of an explanation as to why the Calexus Temple has been moved from Terra, like all of the other Assassin's Temples, but in the case of the Calexus, they moved their whole shebang to the outer edges of the galaxy, beyond even the light of the Astronomicon. That is one fuck of a move. I understand that they don't want to get in the way, being a conclave of psychic blanks after all, they probably would have some adverse effects on any, you know, telepathic communication in the local area, but I think there's a bit more to this level of an extreme relocation, and it may be that they wish to be as far away from any prying eyes as possible. But even then, Imperial cloning technology does have its limits, and I imagine if they were simply just reusing the same operative over and over and over and over again for the last 10,000 years, some of those limitations might manifest in the occasional complication. And considering we're dealing with professional killers here, those complications can get damn interesting damn quickly. So I'm sure if nothing else they would want to supplement the stock on occasion. And whilst it would require an absurd amount of searching, well, it is not impossible to find blanks. And the Officio has access to a great deal of good old cash. And it gets a hell of a lot easier to find the needle in the haystack if you hire 10,000 dudes to search it for you. And I certainly would not put it past the Officio Assassinorum to have put up just such a network. 
Hell, most of them probably don't even know really what they're looking for, and will simply be instructed to call in specialized agents when they think they've found something. In all to your likelihood, the various reports will result in a 99.9 .9 false alarm rate, but when you're looking for something as valuable as a blank, you probably just put up with it and keep grinding, honestly. Because the Kalexus assassins are incredibly valuable. And speaking of, let's finally get into why, shall we? I know, I've gone a bit more into the recruiting area here than I normally do, but I figured it was important in the case of the Kalexus. So, after having, at long last, found a suitable candidate, and then trained them, very, very carefully, mind you, I am sure the training regime is still pretty damn extreme, but I suspect that the Kalexus Temple will take a great deal more care in assuring that whilst their assassin candidates may be bruised and battered, they at least won't die during the training process. Other than a little bit of extra caution, however, the Kalexus assassins will undergo training quite reminiscent of the other assassins. The operative needs to be turned into a living weapon. Obviously, their special nature as psychic blanks will be their primary asset, but due to the hyper-specialized nature of said asset, they need to be able to deal with anything else that might get in their way, such as security systems or guards. It also requires an extensive training period for the operative to fully master his primary weapon, the Animus Speculum. This is a hyper-specialized, hyper-advanced piece of barely understood technology. The helmet is of course stuffed full of all of the usual gadgets you would expect to see in the helmet of an Officio Assassinorum operative. Sensors, communications equipment, bafflers and auspex arrays, but it also houses some far more exotic equipment. The first and perhaps most important being a series of psychic bafflers acting as a de facto psychic hood reducing the effect of the Blank's powers and making him as close to a regular baseline human as it is technologically possible to do. This is absolutely vital because, again, just a baseline Blank will cause people around them to become very uncomfortable and often aggressive towards the Blank. But a blank off the level of a Kalexus assassin, further trained, honed, perfected, and eventually weaponized, uh, oh, that's probably going to result in some far more uh, extreme reactions amongst most people. And after having ensured that the operative is not shot by his own side, the helmet further includes two other pieces of special psychic equipment. The Psycho-Oculum, which allows the operative to see anything that is currently being obfuscated or hidden by various psychic powers. This includes seeing through illusions or seeing past psychic wards. You may try to run from a Kalexus assassin, but you definitely can't hide from one. And the third piece of psychic equipment is the big one, the important one, the so-called Arcane Eye. This is the barely understood part of the helmet, because even the people who are assembling and producing these things, well, they're probably doing so with a lot of crossed fingers and a lot of murmured prayers to the Omnissiah. It functions by drawing upon the unique psychically blank nature of the Kalexus assassin and focusing it into a beam of negative psychic energy. You probably remember that I described the souls of people in the warp as little flames. Well, this beam is essentially a very, very large fire extinguisher that is aimed squarely at those little lights, and they will extinguish the light, the soul, of pretty much anything it strikes, regardless of whether or not the target is a psyker 
or merely just a baseline human? And again, not just humans. This weapon is even effective on the Tau, who have a much smaller presence in the warp than, well, again, pretty much any other living being. If one were to put a little bit of a poetic spin on it, you probably would not be going far wrong if you said that the weapon quite literally extinguishes the target's soul by dousing it in a stream of unnatural psychotic horror. There are a lot of nasty weapons in the 41st millennium, so when I say that this might just be one of the worst ones out there, it really does mean something. And that's for a baseline human. For a psyker, I honestly doubt there is any fate worse than being shot by one of these things. And that includes being slowly raped to death over millennia by a horde of demonic fiends. A not entirely impossible fate for those who delve a little bit too deeply in the mysteries of the war. And yet even that, I believe, probably pales in comparison to being hit by an anima speculum. And just to make things a little bit worse, whilst the anima speculum can be fired at pretty much any time, by drawing upon the blank powers of the operative, it grows exponentially more powerful when exposed to enemy psychers. It literally draws in their psychic powers, their connection to the warp, and uses it to amplify the power of the Blank's own anti-psycho weaponry. Meaning that, regardless of how powerful a psycho may be, there is literally no defense against a Kalexus assassin, because the Psyker's own power will invariably be turned right back upon himself. This power also affects demons. As you've probably already guessed, demons being creatures of pure psychic, or more correctly, warp energy, are not overly fond of Kalexus assassins. I would actually go so far as to say, in all due probability, that the Kalexus Temple is one of very few forces in the galaxy that the demons truly fear. And I say that because of the simple fact that the Anima Speculum is equally so one of very, very few weapons in the galaxy that can actually, truly kill a demon. When a demon's physical form is slain, all that happens is that its spirit, its essence, its soul if you wish, is tossed back into the roiling tides of the Immaterium. The demon is not dead, per se. It is not destroyed. It will eventually re-emerge somewhere in the galaxy, assuming there is a warp rift or a ritual that is powerful enough to allow it to pass through. But the Anima Speculum, well, it is a blank's power. It is the destruction of the soul made manifest. It does not merely slay the physical form of the demon, it attacks the demon's very being itself. And what do you suppose happens to a being of pure psychic energy when it is shot by a weapon that does not merely just destroy psychic energy, but flat out annihilates and erases it. The uh, logical conclusions <laughs> are not too difficult to arrive at, now are they? But the Animus Speculum is not the only weapon of the Kalexus Assassin. He is of course trained to utilize many different form of weaponry should he be left in a bit of a pinch without his Speculum, but the secondary weapon that is carried by most operatives is so-called Psych Out Grenades. These are exceedingly rare grenades crafted from a material that is generated as a byproduct of the operation of the Golden Throne. 
which quite directly results in how unfathomably rare they are. When they are detonated, they spread out this byproduct, a dust-like substance charged with negative psychic energies. When used against normal humans, this will leave them in a catatonic state, their mind quite literally blown of all thoughts, all reason, and all faculties. When used against a psyker, it will quite literally tear holes in his psyche and rip apart his immortal soul, leaving him quite severely worse off. But whilst the area of effect capabilities of the psych out grenades are undoubtedly valued by the operatives, the sheer ludicrous rarity of the grenades probably means that they are only used in extenuating circumstances. And in most cases, a Kalexis operative does not need to rely too much on area of effect weaponry, due to the excellent defensive properties of his Simskin body glove, or more precisely, the layer of a material called Ethereum that is woven into it. This is a level of technology similar in its incomprehensible nature to the Animus Speculum, and it renders the assassin capable of shifting at least part ways out of reality. To a human observer, it would appear as if the assassin is there, and yet not there as if he is moving and yet not moving, as if he is nothing more than a flickering after image on a badly corrupted piece of media. This effect alone would make it very very difficult to effectively target a Kalexus assassin, but when paired with the peculiar powers of a psychic blank that has been trained and honed in the arts of utilising those powers in specific ways, it gets far more difficult. An aspect of a psychic blank is the ability to somewhat blend into the background, to disappear, to be ignored by those around it. This art requires a fair bit of practice on behalf of the user, but when utilised correctly, it can allow a Kalexus assassin to hide his disconcerting nature in such a way as to make himself virtually invisible. Now, the assassin is still there, in plain sight and view, but people are simply unable to notice him. Even if he were to stand right in front of you, your brain would not observe him. Your eyes might see him in the most physical way, but by the time the signal reaches your brain, the slight sense of unease will tell you that there isn't actually anything there, and even if there was something there, it might be better that you don't see it. Utilising this particular aspect of being psychic blank, a Kalexus assassin can actually be a surprisingly effective infiltrator, despite being a horrifying skull-masked monstrosity with a natural air of disturbing ethereal horror to it. I guess there is certainly a case to be made for being so goddamn terrifying that most people will simply decide to go, no, no, I didn't see a damn thing. <laughs> Moving on with my patrol now. I mean, if I had the option, I certainly would probably take that one. The Kalexus Assassin also has with him one final piece of defensive equipment, a so-called Force Matrix. This too is placed within his Sinskin body glove and acts as a focus. When psychic powers are utilised, they are quite wasteful. All but the most proficient of psychers leave behind quite a lot of residual force in the material universe when they utilise their powers. 
The Force Matrix, as its name somewhat implies, is able to feed upon and gather this energy from the void around it, pulling it in and using it to strengthen the assassin, both by feeding it into the anima speculum, obviously, and also allowing the assassin to utilize the powers in more obscure ways possibly even allowing him to enhance his own abilities as a blank, in much the same way that the Animus Speculum is able to absorb and refocus the energies of a Psyche. And now that we've got all of that covered, I guess we're going to move on to the third and final aspect of any assassin. The favoured targets, and in this case... <laughs> I think you already have a relatively good idea of what kind of targets the Kalexus are usually sent out after. Psychers. And not just psychers, as in human psychers, but the psychers of other races as well. For example, the Eldar have a particularly vicious loathing of the Kalexus, who they view as. well. Unnatural abominations, and <laughs> I mean, they have a point, don't they? Bear in mind that the Eldar are an inherently psychic race who maintain their immortality by, upon the moment of death, housing their spirits within soul stones. You can imagine just how horrific a Kalexus assassin might be to such a race. Mm, yes, yes, indeed. The Elder have naturally made the occasional attempt to wipe out the Kalexus for none too difficult to understand reasons, but the only ones that have made any real progress is Alaitok, and specifically an Elder Farseer by the name of Aladrios Kulkasian. He even managed to discover the location of Kalexa's hyper-secretive temple, located somewhere on the outer fringes of the galaxy. But after dispatching a strike force to destroy it, he received a vision that were the Kalexus to be annihilated, then that would in turn lead to the complete and utter destruction of Craftworld Alitok. Not understanding why or how this could possibly happen, but trusting in his vision, he recalled the strike force, and after that, never told anyone else about the location of the temple. And besides our entrepreneuring farce, no one else has really had any success in locating the Kalexus, and so none have ever been able to strike at them directly, although I imagine there are plentiful forces in the galaxy that would absolutely love to do so. <laughs> and a few of them would also probably go, oh, this will lead to the destruction of an Eldar craft world, eh? Bonus! But that may be another reason why the Kalexas keep themselves so well hidden, knowing that they have uh, frighteningly few friends out there in the galaxy. But beyond the obvious targets that are, again, of course, psychers, be they human rogue psychers, or Eldar psychers, or any other form of psychers, the Kalexus Temple are also often utilized to assassinate non-psychic individuals. Due to the peculiar nature of their blank talents, as mentioned, they can actually be surprisingly good infiltrators. And remember, the speculum is just as lethal to normal humans as it is to psychers, or, well, it may be more correct to say that it is lethal to normal beings and just doubly as lethal to psychic beings. Yes, that's more correct. So, in those cases where, for example, a Calidus assassin may take too long, and an Eversaw be a bit too much of an assassination, then a Kalexus may very well fulfill a good middle ground between those two extremes, of a lengthy, detailed and precise infiltration, and, well, a crater, essentially, in the case of the Eversaw. 
Additionally, Calexus assassins are also, on occasion, on very, 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 very rare occasions, dispatched as a part of a larger force, a so-called execution force, where a representative of each of the major temples are dispatched together to take on particularly hardened targets. It was the Calexus member of such a force that finally ended up killing the Tau Ethereal Supreme Aun Var during the Agrellan Campaign. But of course, the formation of such execution forces are quite rare, and in most cases, the Relative rarity and few numbers of Calexus operatives means that they will probably be deployed primarily against their favoured targets. After all, if you have a weapon that is so excessively effective at killing one particular thing, you probably want to be deploying it against that one particular thing as often as possible. Because, well, why would you not? And with those undeniable words of wisdom, I will bid you adieu once again, hoping that you have received all the knowledge you could ever possibly wish for about the Calexus Temple. Until next time, I have been Arch. Please do share the video around if you feel that it was worth watching, and leave a like and a comment below, because it does help quite a lot with those YouTube algorithms. Until next time, have a good day.